Hi there, my name is Vic Veer. I'm an ENT consultant surgeon that works for the National Health Service in England. Today I want to tell you about something called Upper Airway Resistance Syndrome. Now the reason why I'm making this video is because I've realised that an awful lot of people don't know what this condition is. This is surprising to me because we treat this condition on the NHS for free at the Royal National ENT Hospital in central London near Euston area. So today I'm going to tell you about what it is, what the symptoms are, how do you diagnose it and how do you treat it. So the first thing to say about upper airways resistance syndrome is that it's not snoring and it isn't obstructive sleep apnea. So snoring is a so free flow of air going through your mouth and your throat, but as the air passes through it vibrates some tissues at the back of your throat causing that characteristic sound that we all know. Obstructive sleep apnea on the other hand is where the throat completely closes up and no air comes through at all. So instead of snoring you get a and you can't breathe at all, the oxygen levels drop down and some people actually also wake up. Those little waking up periods are so short that you don't actually notice it when you're sleeping, but it's enough to cause a disturbance in your sleep and make you tired during the day. Now upper airways resistance syndrome is very different in that it doesn't actually ever stop you from breathing. What you're doing is, is you're breathing through a very narrow airway. So in this case you're going like a so you can see that you're getting air in and out you can do it, you're not stopping breathing, your oxygen levels aren't dropping, but it's very hard to do that. You need to work quite hard to get the air in and out. Now in one aspect that's very good, you don't lower your oxygen levels, you don't become hypoxic as it were, you don't go blue. However, you are working very hard and because you're working very hard, instead of resting all night, you spend the whole night fighting to breathe, you wake up tired and you get other symptoms suggestive of sleep deprivation. You lose your concentration, you can't memorise things, you do badly at work. If you're sleep deprived enough you get anxious and you get anxiety issues and you get some of the symptoms of obstructive sleep apnea, waking up unrefreshed, feeling tired through the day, having a headache in the morning, sweating at night. The classical upper air resistance syndrome patient is a tall, thin, young man and they've had a sleep study done elsewhere. They've been told, you don't have sleep apnea, don't worry, You've, you're tired because of another reason, go and do some exercise. But then when they see us and we diagnose upper air resistance syndrome, it all makes sense to them. And when we treat it, they all feel better. So the main problem with diagnosing upper airways resistance syndrome is that so far around the world we have no clear definition for it. We don't know how to describe it yet. Now a lot of people around the world use something called RARES, which are respiratory effort-related arousals. So that means when someone keeps taking deep breaths, they're trying really hard to breathe and they're breathing so hard that it partly wakes them up, gives them something what's known as a microarousal. They are waking up a little bit but they don't actually remember it that microarousal triggers off a point or a, a rarer on the sleep study. And then we count up all of these during the night and we can say, yes, okay, you don't have sleep apnea, but you do have upper airways resistance syndrome. Now that's really good because it's a nice easy way to pick up these patients. But I think it's probably missing some people because you do find people who are working very hard to breathe, but it doesn't wake them up. They're putting an awful lot of respiratory effort into their breathing at night and therefore getting tired and having symptoms of sleep apnea in the morning but they don't actually wake up at night. So it's not the waking up that's tiring them up, it's the actual effort of breathing all night. And we worked out the best way to do this is to put a probe into your nose and lie it in the middle of your esophagus, so that's the gullet that goes from your throat into your stomach, leaving it there all night and measuring how much effort you are using at night. Now, as you can imagine, if you're talking about young people, particularly children, putting a probe into their stomach and trying to get them to sleep with that in, it's quite difficult and can mess up the upper airway, but currently it is the gold standard. Now around the world a lot of people use something called flow limitation. Flow limitation is uh, picked up by these nasal prongs that go into your nose and what they do is they measure how much breathing you normally do and if you suddenly notice that the breathing rate goes down or the, the amount of air flowing through your nose goes down then we start calling that well that the flow has been limited and therefore maybe they're going they're trying harder, not as much air is coming in and out. Now the problem with flow limitation is that if you have a blocked nose to begin with, that makes the level look too high and then you artificially pick up people with upper air resistance syndrome when it's really not true. But it works very well if you have a nice clear airway. Now another thing we use is something called the RIP phase. RIP phase stands for Respiratory Inductance Plasmatography and it's incredibly difficult to say and I'm not going to say it again. Now the way the rip phase is calculated is using these bands that go across your chest and across your abdomen and when you take a deep breath it stretches these bands and it gets picked up by the sleep report monitor. And then you compare that to your normal shallow breathing that everyone does while they're sleeping against a 
the sort of breathing that you do when you're really pushing hard and getting trying to get air into your lungs, that shows respiratory effort and it's a good way to pick up these patients. So there's another thing called pulse transit time, which measures how quickly a pulse goes from one area to another. Now that works very well, except there are some limitations and it makes too many assumptions in my mind and should be backed up by some of the other outcome measures which I've just talked about. On top of this, there are lots of softer signs that you should be considering, such as just respiratory rate, how much people breathe, how quickly they breathe. So if someone's going, <sighs> that means they're obviously working harder than someone who's just doing a nice shallow sleep time breathing like we normally do. Also, a lot of people with this problem seem to move around a lot at night and they keep changing their position, particularly the children. We call it helicoptering in children. When you walk into your child's bedroom, you see them sleeping at a different angle every time you look at them. And that's what we call helicoptering. A lot of adults do the same. They're always trying to breathe. Like children breathe with an extended position. They're just trying desperately to get air in and out. And when the doctor says to them, oh, sorry, you don't have sleep apnea. Don't worry, everything's fine. And then you see a video of them just go, that, that obviously is not right. There's something going on there. And those children seem to have upper airways resistance syndrome. And that's why they're moving around desperately trying to get air into their lungs. The other thing we look at is pulse variability. The pulse rate should be relatively low and just simmers along at night whilst you're resting. Sometimes it goes a little bit higher with uh, dreams and things like that. But normally it's quite low. But if you're working very hard, you can imagine that your pulse rate goes up because you're almost exercising to get air in and out of your lungs. So that's another slightly softer sign that we look for. And putting all of these signs together with the flow limitation, the rip phase, everything together, you can make a diagnosis or you can you make an attempt at a diagnosis of someone with upper airways resistance syndrome. You can go on to try and treat those people. So although upper airway resistance syndrome is quite difficult to diagnose, actually it's quite easy to treat because a lot of these patients are quite young, they're physically quite healthy, except they just can't breathe properly at night. And all it takes is a careful examination, looking at their nose, see if they're all blocked up and that's just raising the flow limitation. But if they truly have upper airways resistance syndrome, they have a problem down in their throat. And you look down there, you might see, say, large tonsils. Or if they've had their tonsils out and they had huge tonsils before, sometimes we often leave the tonsil sitting on the back of the tongue, what we call the lingual tonsil. The lingual tonsil drops back and blocks your breathing. And if it does that, all you have to do is shrink that down. You can breathe behind that. You only need a few millimeters to be able to breathe behind the back of your tongue for you to feel much better again afterwards. Obviously, there are people out there who prefer to use something like CPAP or BiPAP, which pumps air in. And that works very well in the majority of people. But often we feel like we don't need to go that far because a mandibular advancement device is all that we require in most cases, assuming they don't have a blocked nose or, or a big tonsils or something like that. Some people only have upper airways resistance syndrome when lying on their back, and that's obvious because their tongue is falling back and blocking off their breathing. Now, again, a mandibular advancement device would work well for that, but you can have something called positional devices, which make you sleep on your side at night, and so your tongue falls forward and that doesn't cause that problem. But some people who have had obstructive sleep apnea are diagnosed when they're sleeping on their back, or so-called supine obstructive sleep apnea. They're told, oh, just sleep on your side or, or use something like a slumber bump, which is like a, a thing that sits behind you, keeps you sleeping on your side. Just use that and you should be fine in the morning. And these patients go away, use the slumber bump or some other positional device to sleep on their side. And they come back and they say, yes, I know that my sleep study looks better now now that I've used this device, but I still feel tired. And the doctor will say to them, well, your apnea index is very low now, it should be fine. But if you look at those patients, you'll notice that they may have obstructive sleep apnea lying on their back but they actually have upper airways resistance syndrome when lying on their side. So you mustn't get confused in thinking that you can only have upper airways resistance syndrome and only have obstructive sleep apnea. There's often a mix between these and teasing that out in the sleep study is really important. What I wanted to say is I hope you found this video informative. I hope you've gained value from it. And if you have, please do consider subscribing. Thank you very much for watching.